so much health scholar. I'm sure we'll be having special welcome across the board um, a little later in the program, but let me just say again, welcome to everyone. And we pray that a special blessing will be on you and your family today. All right, I'm gonna ask the host to allow me share screen privilege. We're gonna be doing a special item of music, after which I'll be inviting brother Matthew Westcar, member here at CFMI. He'll be leading out in our study discussion this morning. We're studying lesson number four in the series, uh, uh, Agencies of the Plan of Salvation. The captain of our salvation is a topic of our lesson for today. Okay, after the special item of music, then Brother Westgar will be leading out in our study discussion. Feel free to be as engaging as possible in this discussion. In Jesus for it all. I've heard them sing, I'm coming home and heed the master's call. I've heard them sing the modern songs and songs of long ago. But amazing grace, so sweet the sound is the sweetest song I know. Amazing grace, so sweet the sound. Oh, how sweet is the sound. No sweeter song, sweeter song. In this life be could be found Heard about the Savior's blood Washed as white, with white as snow But amazing grace, so sweet the sound Is the sweetest song I know It was the song my mother sang In sweet and humble voice Like music from the world above It made my soul rejoice it's soothing words and melodies that the rippling waters flow. But amazing grace, so sweet the sound is the sweetest song I know. Amazing grace, so sweet the sound, oh how sweet is the sound. Sweeter song, sweeter song in this life could be found. Heard about the Savior's blood. it's over to you. Okay. Thank you, Pastor. Good uh, afternoon here in Jamaica and uh, morning, I'm guessing, in the other sides of the world, um, whatever time it is. Um, happy Sabbath and uh, welcome here to our lesson study um, for this particular Sabbath. I want to take the time out to welcome our pastors, our leaders, um, from all over the world who have joined in through the various platforms here for our convention, our convocation. And uh, we, I'm, I'm in responsible for the lesson study this morning, and uh, we want to get straight into it. 
the lesson study. Um, and I'm, I always make the point that I'm the facilitator of the lesson study. Hence, I encourage your points for you to share that which um, strikes you or come out to you as we go along in our study. All right. So this is our lesson study, Agencies of the Plan of Salvation. And uh, if possible, I would ask for the screen sharing privilege. I'll ask the host for that, um, if it be possible. It says, Agencies of the Plan of Salvation. This is lesson nine, um, entitled, The Captain of Our Salvation. Our memory verse is Hebrews chapter two and verse nine and 10. And I will read in your hearing. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became him, for whom were all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many, bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. So that is our memory verse entitling Christ, the captain of our salvation. And the very first question on Sunday, October 23rd, 2022, the very first question says, by what title is Jesus designated in his relation to the plan of salvation? And we just read in Hebrews chapter two and verse 10, that he's a captain of our salvation, which to me strikes me. And the captain of our salvation, I'm like, where else in the Bible has Christ ever been spoken of as a captain of anything or referred to as the captain? And if you don't mind, you could just turn with me quickly to Joshua chapter five. We see someplace very interesting where he is referred to as a captain. Now, granted here, it's speaking the context of salvation, but we're going to see something how the ideologies here in the Bible are somewhat intertwined. Um, just so Joshua chapter five, verse 14 and 15. So Joshua chapter five, verses 14 and 15. And it says, and he said, nay, but as a captain of the host of the Lord, am I now come? And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship. And said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's, uh, Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. We know here that this was Christ here that appeared to Joshua. And he is in warring mode. Um, so we know that his title here would have been Michael, or the name that he would um, apply here or the bible generally applies when he is in the mode for war is michael and he is described as captain of the lord's host and he appeared to joshua here before they went to overthrow jericho we know jericho was this great walled city one of the main cities they had to overcome in order for them to get to or to settle into their inheritance into their inheritance the promised land jericho we know this this great city that fell is a type of the papacy or a type of babylon that great city that ruled over the kings of the earth and so for the captain of the Lord host to come, it's showing then that he's the one that will enable his people to overcome Jericho, uh, which points to Babylon at the end of the world. He's going to be the one that allows us to overcome Babylon. And indeed, we need to overcome Babylon, confusion, the ideologies of Babylon, the lifestyle of Babylon, in order for us to obtain or to ascertain salvation. Through God's grace and through God's spirit, we can overcome Babylon and be um, those that are saved forevermore. Another place, interestingly, as he spoke of this, as he was a captain of the Lord's host appearing unto Joshua, 
he then did something very interesting. He said to him that in verse 15, and the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, loose thy shoe from off thy foot for the place wherein thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. And there's another place there that brings us to another place in the Bible where Moses was there at the burning bush. And here again, Christ is appearing to another patriarch. And he said the very same thing to him. Loose the sandals from off thy foot because the place where thou standest is holy. And this was before he sent Moses back into Egypt and to take his people out of Egypt. And we know that Egypt, by a simple Bible study, Egypt is a type of the world at large. And indeed, God's people must overcome the world as well. So must overcome Babylon and all that entails Babylon. And we must overcome the world because all that is in the world is lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. The three things that Christ himself overcame in the wilderness. He indeed overcame the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life. Even so, um, his people must also overcome. So when we think of Christ as the captain of our salvation, we do not have to leave it there that he's the chief guy that is going to carry out this particular work. But um, we know that he works along with the rest of the Godhead and along with the other heavenly intelligences. But he's the one that promised himself, of course, for a shorty for a race. He was the one that um, has been intertwined with our race from the very beginning as the Lamb of God slain from the foundations of the world. But he's also the one that is going to deliver us from Babylon is going to help us to overcome Babylon and to help us to overcome the world at large. And if anybody have any points to add to that, you may feel free to do so now. All right, awesome. So, um, so I don't know how long I was gone for. Um, can you guys indicate um, the last part of what I said that you guys heard, if possible? All right, if not, um, what you, 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 may go, you may go ahead, brother. Okay, so what we're saying was that we showed a few places from the Bible where Christ is mentioned as an author. Um, well, not author, as the captain. And we went to Joshua and we showed that he was a captain of the Lord's host that appeared unto Joshua before the fall of Jericho. We then mentioned the fact that Jericho was a type of the of Babylon, this great city that reigned over the kings of the earth, and showed that when God appeared as a captain there, he was to deliver his people from Jericho, what that was a type of Babylon. We also mentioned the fact that when he appeared unto Joshua, he told him to loose the sandals from off his foot, to loose the shoe from off his foot, for the place where he standed is holy. We said that as the very same thing that he said unto, he said that unto Moses at the burning bush. He said the very same thing, and we know that he, kept, he went there, or he came there to deliver his people from Egypt. And we said that God's people, for them to obtain salvation, must overcome Babylon and all that entails Babylon, or the lifestyle, the practices, the doctrines of Babylon, and also the practices and lifestyle of the world itself. So indeed, when Christ appeared as a captain in the Bible, is to deliver his people, one from Babylon, the other from the world. So when we think of Christ being the captain of our salvation, we can not only just think of him being the chief guy. Indeed, he's the chief heavenly intelligence that is responsible for this, along with the Father, along with the Holy Spirit and the angels that are there. But indeed, he's the chief guy. But when he appears as a captain, he's appearing to deliver his people from something, from Babylon, from the world, from sin. As all that is in the world, as we know, is the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. And I was saying that if there is any um, body that wants to add anything to this, we can do so now. Yes, yes, um, Pastor Sankey. Yeah, you're, you were bringing out the fact that um, this, of course, was the uh, same experience that Moses had at the burning bush and um, referring to what Joshua said or calls him as the captain of the Lord's host. I just wanted to... Uh, Go to Exodus chapter three, read something, and then we can tie that back in with Michael, the archangel, um, since it's called the angel of the Lord here. Amen. So in the book of Exodus chapter three, um, we'll just, we'll, we'll, we'll start in verse two. 
So in Exodus 3, verse 2, it says, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a fire, in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither. Uh, put off thy shoe from off thy feet for the place whereupon thou standest is holy ground. And then he goes in to describe himself as the God of, of, of his father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. So in verse two, the Bible describes it as the angel of the Lord goes into the burning bush, right? Amen. And then very clearly it identifies it as God. So uh, God being described here as an angel, uh, this would tie very, very nicely back into the captain of the Lord's host being Michael, the archangel, uh, the phrase archangel being the czar or leader of angels. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, much appreciated. Anybody else with any points about that? Uh, we can go to question two. And question two, who is he to all who obey him? And we find the answer in Hebrews chapter five and verse nine. So Hebrews chapter five and verse nine. And it says, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. So Christ is the author of, of the eternal salvation to all those that obey him. And another place in Hebrews that mentions Christ as an author is Hebrews chapter 12 and verse two. So Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, and it says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. And so indeed, Christ is the author and the finisher of our faith. And when we know somebody is an author, well, what comes to mind? What comes to our mind when we think of somebody as an author? An author is somebody that writes. He's a person that um, jots down. He's an individual that writes, whether books or articles or periodicals, but whatever it is, it's an individual that writes. And when we think of Christ as a writer, we, of course, think of the word of God, we think of him writing the law, even the laws upon our hearts. And indeed, that is something that he does. He's the one that will write the laws in our minds and in our hearts. When you think of him as an author of eternal salvation, you're think of, thinking of him as somebody that's going to write something somewhere. Not only does he write the word of God, which is to be our guide and to be a revelation of himself unto us. He also will write his words, write his laws in our hearts, in our minds as well. All right. Now, if anybody wants to, anybody wants to add a point to that, if not, we will go ahead. Question three. Oh uh, yeah, brother. I would like to add and uh, happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Uh, you know what? Uh, I was I was thinking uh, about Hebrews uh, chapter two, verses uh, nine and ten. Um, if, if I could, if I could read that for you, it says, sure. but we see Jesus, you know, and it, and it mentions him by name now. So we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became him talking about Jesus again, for whom all things are and by whom all things and, and by whom are all things and bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings so anyway i just just want to uh, add that uh here thank you amen thank you my brother so question three now question three Name one person who was said to be waiting for the advent of this captain and author of salvation. To find the answer, we're going to read Luke chapter 2 and verse 25. So Luke chapter 2 and verse 25. And it says, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, 
waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Ghost was upon him. And so this gentleman, we know him by the name of Simeon. All right, so this is a gentleman that was waiting for the advent of this captain and author for salvation. Question four kind of flows directly into it. So we'll just address it at the same time. Question four, what had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit? So what was revealed unto Simeon by the Holy Spirit? So verse 26 of the same chapter so gives us the answer. It says, and it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And so the Holy Spirit revealed to him that you're not going to die until you see Christ. That should be clear as day. Question five, again, these questions flow, so we're just dealing with them directly. I'm dealing with them one after the other. Verse five, and saying, being directed to the temple at the exact moment of the Savior's presentation, what did he say? So the answer is from Luke, it's the same chapter from verse 30 through to verse 32. And verse 30 to 32 says this, for mine eyes have seen the salvation which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. So this was what this man Simeon declared um, of Christ. He is see the salvation of God. Indeed, he, he is our salvation. And he is the one that is not only to bring salvation to Israel, but he also is to lighten the Gentiles. The light that is shining from the cross illuminates the entire world or can illuminate the entire world. Whosoever in this world may receive him. He's a light of the world. Amen. All right. Anybody want to add anything to that before we move forward? If not, we'll go directly ahead. Question six. Question six says, what was the Savior called more than 500 years before he was born into the human family? And to find this, we're going to go to Daniel chapter seven and verse 13. So Daniel chapter seven and verse 13. What was the Savior called more than 500 years before he was born into the human family? Daniel chapter seven. And verse 13, and it says, I saw in the night's visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came before the clouds of heaven and came to the ancients of days, and they brought him near before him. So this is a prophet Daniel, as it says, over 500 years before Christ um, was born into this world, and he was called the Son of Man quite profound, really showing um, his, his role and that indeed this was understood by the prophets of old um, to an extent. Um, we want to read a statement that was right below this. And this is note one. Note one says, the spirit called Christ, the son of man through the prophets 500 years before he was born into the human family. And nearly 2,500 years prior to the actual fulfillment of the prophecy in anticipation of him being born unto us. Very powerful stuff. So indeed, he's born unto us, as we soon touch that, touch that scripture. And he's born the son of man, showing that he takes part in humanity he he clothed his divinity with humanity he is the god man he is 100 percent god 100 percent man he is the one that shows that divinity in combination with humanity does not sin he's the one that does this for us um, question seven so question seven why did he become the son of man that's the question why did he become the son of man? Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 17. Let's get the answer. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 17. Why did he become the son of man? And it says, Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of 
the people. And so he is made like his brethren, he's made like unto his brethren. He is the son of man so that he can make reconciliation for the sins of his people. He had to come here and experience what man experienced. He had to, as man, depending solely upon his father, um, face what man faced and overcome what uh, man failed to overcome. Um, yes, Pastor. Yes, Pastor. Thank you. Um, I just want to uh, tie in that phrase, uh, basically what you just read in Hebrews chapter two, but I want to tie in that phrase that was taken from the book of Isaiah. So uh, where it talks about unto us, uh, he was born. So uh, just reading Isaiah chapter nine, verse six, I think it's very powerful, very important to understand um, really what's being emphasized here. So in Isaiah 9, verse 6, it says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So this phrase, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, um, emphasizes the point that it was not just momentary, that when Christ you know, literally became the son of man, um, he was forever to identify himself with the human race. And this is why Hebrews 2 refers to us as his brethren. And throughout the spirit of prophecy, he's referred to us as our elder brother uh, in heaven. So he is forever one with the human race. When God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, he literally gave Christ to the human race. And I think that's uh, just a beautiful thought of the, the gift that he is amen amen couldn't agree more exactly and so we see that he's really born onto us um august and roxy that's the name you can go ahead yeah bro um you know i i i um kind of kind of had a question uh really so much um i know in genesis uh 3 15 uh the, the, the prophecy was given was that uh, you know, her seed, her seed is is going is going to crush the uh, serpent, and we and we know Jesus uh, is the is the one who who is uh, uh, being talked about, who who is who is being you know uh, prophesied about, uh, you know, calls him uh, the seed of, of 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 Eve. So so with so with that being said, like okay, uh, Jesus is known as a, as a son of man. And we know Adam. Uh, I, I think I, I think Adam means means man. So so Jesus is known as a as a son of Adam, son of man. But you know he is the seed of of of, of Eve. So I I don't know. I I was been been trying to work that understanding out here. And uh, if uh, you know someone could could, could kind of help me, you know that I'd be great. Okay, well, to be honest with you, I'm not fully, I don't think I fully understand the question, but maybe there's somebody else here that understood the question and would like to give it a shot. If not, you could just repeat it for me, please. Yeah, yeah, I, I'll repeat it. So, so my question is, is this, Jesus is known as the son of man. Yes. Okay, all right. And, and we know from, from uh, uh, the uh, interpretation of names, Adam is 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 man and and so and so all right so in, so in, so in one case jesus is known as the son of adam the, the the son of man but you know but he's but but he's not the seed of of Adam. you know he is the seed of of a eve uh you know because of his uh because of his virgin birth you know same 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 way eve had a had a virgin birth. Um, it, it's it's a, some sense of actual sin, sinless birth. Uh, you know, Jesus is is the actual uh, seed seed of Eve according to Genesis three fifteen. So yeah. I kind of just wanted to just uh, uh, you know get some help with the with the with the understanding. Uh, you know of that. Uh, you know what I'm saying you know Jesus Jesus in, in one case is is known as the as the seed of Eve. But in another case, he's known as the as the son of Adam. Uh, okay, how I does see. that? Yeah, yeah. 
Okay, I think I understand the question. Again, is there anybody that wants to go at it before I attempt to answer? Oh. Okay. If not. So if I'm getting you right, you're asking how is Christ the son of Adam and also the seed of Eve? If I'm getting you right. And uh, well, what we can know and what we do know from the Bible, Christ is of the posterity of Adam because really and truly all that are born on the earth is of the posterity of Adam. And we know that each and every one is also of the posterity of Eve because all that is born of the earth comes from Eve as well. And so indeed, Christ is indeed the seed of the woman because he comes from the woman and is also the seed of man because he came from the man as well. Every single human being that, has born, that is born upon this earth came from those two human, human beings. So Christ himself coming from these two as well was indeed a result of the union of those two as well in terms of his physical sense or when he was reincarnated was of those two persons as a result of those two persons coming together in the first place. Um, I don't know if that's an overly simplistic answer and if you are looking for something a bit more than that, I guess Pastor can do so. Yes, Pastor? No, I was just going to keep it simple as well. Uh, you have the name Adam. Adam, of course, means man, but it's referring to mankind. So he was the he was the beginning of all mankind. Uh, and Eve was given the name Eve because she was the mother of all living, uh, the Bible says. So just to piggyback off what you were saying. Okay, exactly. Because if you look at what Adam really means, as you said, it's a human being. It's really mankind. All right? So it's a human being. So indeed... Mm -hmm. Okay. And just to say, both male and female, man and woman, were called Adam. She was only differentiated after sin. So Adam okay. is a type for humanity, and uh, Eve is the mother of all living. Amen, amen, amen. So we can now go to question eight. I hope that answers um, your question, my brother. I hope it does. All right. So question eight, question eight. Unto whom was he born? And what titles are here ascribed to him? And so um, Pastor went through this. So we're going to just go back there a little bit, um, just to read it again uh, for emphasis. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. And it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And so here we see some titles of Christ. Um, he's called Wonderful. He's a Counselor. He's a Mighty God and Everlasting Father and the Prince of Peace. Very wonderful, very um, powerful things, um, powerful names. Um, one that stood out to me while reading this um, earlier was the fact that he's called a Counselor. And we know we need a counselor or, or uh, we would say a lawyer in the case of a tribunal. We know that Christ is the one that is our counselor. He's our advocate in the investigative judgment. And not only that, he also gives counsel. He also gives advice as well as somebody that actually counsels an individual. And we know this in the book of Revelation, chapter 3 and verse 18. He's the one that gives counsel to Laodicea. Um, he's the one that gives counsel to the churches throughout the ages, because even from Ephesus coming right down, he's the one that outlined their condition and give the recommended um, action or the recommended remedy for his churches throughout the age. So he's indeed the one that counsels and guides his churches throughout the age, in an addition to being a counselor or an advocate in the investigative judgment. He's our advocate. Um, he's the one that now defends us and pleads his blood on our part, even in the judgment. That's just one of them that really jumped out of out me, out of all of these um, wonderful and many titles that he would have as well. And I know it's very interesting because in Proverbs chapter one, we see Christ here speaking. Um, we could just turn there a little bit. Proverbs chapter one, and we're going to read um, from verse 22 to 25. There's something he's talking about this very same council. He offers this to um, his people, but when his people neglect it, there's an end result for neglecting the counsel of God. 
In Proverbs chapter 1, verse 22 to 25, it says, How long ye simple ones will ye love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn ye at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you, and I will make known my words unto you. Because I have called, and ye refuse. I have stretched out my hand, and no man regarded. But ye have set at naught all my counsel and would none of my reproof and he goes on and he begins to say how it laugh when the calamity cometh really showing um, the time that this will happen this is end of the world situation coming of christ situation he's saying i would have saved you but you didn't take my counsel so indeed christ is the counselor um, of his people he's a great counselor he's a wonderful god a mighty god the everlasting father the prince of peace anybody want to add anything to this before we go to the next question if not i'll, I'll, I'll say something as well um you just emphasizing counselor um that also reminds me of revelation 3 where of course he comes uh you know i counsel thee to buy me gold so uh, Christ is emphasized there as well as the counselor. Amen, amen, amen. Okay, now question nine. What record have we of his pre-existence? That's the question. What record have we of his pre-existence? And the first scripture given is Genesis 1, verse 26. So Genesis 1, verse 26, and I'll read in your hearing. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So we hear God saying, let us, and us is a word that represents plural, represent more than one. So whoever God here represents, um, it's talking about more than one beings having a conversation and they're saying let us make man in our own image and uh, we, we we know that this is indeed christ in john chapter one and verse one let us know that the word was with god and by him were all things made so we indeed know that this is christ and talk about us this is the father and christ having a conversation together um, if we look also another scripture that was given is micah chapter five and verse two Micah chapter five and verse two. And again, I'll read in your hearing. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee he come forth, shall he come forth unto me, that is to be a ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been from of old, from everlasting. So indeed, Christ has been of old. He has been from everlasting. And that means he was not um, brought forth at a later date in history in the, in the sense of being a created being, but it has always been there coexistent with his father from the very beginning. John chapter 17 and verse 5. John chapter 17 and verse 5. And when we're there, amen. It says, and now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. And so indeed, before he came to this earth, he existed. He was with the Father from the very beginning, and he was asking his Father here to glorify him with that glory he had before the world was. Okay? And I want to add anything to that, so we're going to go forward. So. We're going to go forward to so question 10. So question 10, and it says, um, question is, what testimony of his agency, but just a second, let me just make sure I get that clear. It says, what testimony is given of his agency in creation? What testimony is given of his agency in creation? All right, so we're going to go to John chapter 1, which we quoted a bit earlier. John chapter 1 from verse 1 to 3. So John chapter 1 from verse 1 to 3. And it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And so we know this word is Christ. 
Christ was with God from the very beginning and all things were made by him. Colossians chapter one from verse 15 to 17. The next scripture, Colossians chapter one from verse 15 to 17. And when we're there, amen. And let us read, I'll read in your hearing. Amen. Who is the image of the invisible God? the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that were in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether there be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. I can read verse 17. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. All right, even that's especially chapter um, verse 17 there goes ahead and again shows the pre-existent nature of Christ, pre-advent, he was there, uh, shows it very clearly. And the final scripture about this point is Hebrews chapter one, from verse one to three. Hebrews chapter one, from verse one to three, again, I'll read in your hearing, and it says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, had in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he had appointed here of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. And so we indeed see Christ was agency, or he participated greatly in the creation of the world. Very, very clear, clear point. Um, so with the, there's no comments on that. Question 11, question 11. What exhibition of creative power is seen in connection with the plan of salvation? Now, this is interesting. What exhibition of creative power is seen in connection with the plan of salvation? Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. What exhibition of creative power is seen in connection with the plan of salvation? So notice verse 10. It says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. So this is, again, very interesting stuff here. So we are his workmanship and we're created in Christ Jesus unto good work. We know that any man in Christ Jesus is a new creature. A new creature, there must be some regeneration. There must be some um, creation taking place there. There must be the eradication of the old nature and the instilling of, an, of a nature that is totally foreign to man. The nature of Christ is foreign to man because we indeed, our nature, our flesh is enmity with God because we're not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be to, um, to create a man or for Christ to transform a man's character into from being the enemies of God, enemies by one, the flesh, and by two, we are friends of the world. Naturally, we are friends of the world. And to allow that man to be his friend as Abraham was his friend and to walk with God as Enoch walked with Enoch, then there must be an aspect of creation taking place. There must be the destruction of a certain nature and the creation of something entirely foreign to that individual within that individual. I hope that makes sense, that especially that last part. But chapter four, the next um, verse re reference is chapter four of the same Ephesians. Ephesians chapter four, verse 22 to 24. And notice what it says. So Ephesians chapter four, 22 to 24. Notice what it says. That he put off concerning the former conversation of the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Exactly what we said before. This is what was said here. There's a destruction of the old man, the dying of the old man, and then there's a new man rising, this new birth. So indeed, a new man that will be in God's image and God's glory, not just the nature that were given by Adam, which after Adam fell, he had a son in his own image and his own likeness. But we can be as Adam before his fall, where we can be created back or a recreation back into God's own image and 
God's likeness. Okay? And we're going to read a note about this. Uh, so question 12, the notes. No, not yet, not yet. We're not going to read the notes. Question 12. What evidence did he give of... Excuse me? I'll make a comment on... Um, sure. Sure. And um, so speaking about the creative power um, uh, connected with the plan of salvation, also, um, I want to... Um, went into Romans, you know, in the book of Romans, um, chapter six, verses six and seven, we, as we think about being created over again, knowing, you know, um, we, well, I'll back up a little bit, in verse, Romans six, verse two, yes, um, know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Yes. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. But like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And so baptism, again, is a, a form of God recreating mankind. You're speaking about uh, mankind um, in the sinful nature then God has to now, um, you know, we have to confess, repent, and turn away from that sinful nature. And then when we are baptized, we come up a, a new creature. So this is a sure, uh, again, being recreated again in newness of life. And so, I, um, and, um, you know, as um, um, this knowing, Verse again in verse six and seven, uh, also in Romans six, verse six and seven, knowing this is that that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. That henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is free from sin. So this baptism is a powerful, uh, um, I would say, a powerful way of man being being created again. In the newness uh, of of being a new man, you know, created again, which is again showing creative power. Uh, when you think about someone who is um, in sin and um, in bondage to sin, to be freed from that and to be recreated again is very creative. It's very powerful, which God does when you think about baptism. Amen. Amen. Dare I say it's the greatest miracle um, and the greatest exhibition of creative power to change man's nature from sinful to sinless. Greatest exhibition of creative power, in my opinion, at least. Right? In so the question 12. Question 12. What evidence did he give of creative power revealed through him while in the world? And it makes reference to no two. No two. Christ gave abundant evidence of his creative power while in the world by healing the lame and those who had the leprosy, restoring sight to the blind and hearing to the deaf, by supplying bread to the multitude, turning water into wine and raising the dead. So as all of these showed his ability to recreate and to regenerate and to create things from scratch, especially, I believe, even that multiplication of the bread. He generally had to now create uh, matter, turn some of the matter into bread, or even just create matter out of nowhere at all, in order for that bread to be created. He literally took from a very small piece of bread like this, or however big it would be, and allow it to be as probably as massive as this room that I'm in now. And so indeed, that's a great exhibition of his creative power and it really gives you a literal representation of him creating something out of nothing right there just like what he had to do in the beginning when he had to create uh, the worlds out of nothing there was nothing and then there was he created matter time space energy and all of that all right if no anybody wants to add to that before we move to question 13 If not, we will go to question 13, which says, to what extent is he able to bring complete salvation to man? Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25. 
question is, to what extent is he able to bring complete salvation to man? Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25 says this, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing that he ever liveth to make intercession for them. The question is, to what extent? To the uttermost. No matter what man's condition is, no matter who the individual is, no matter what their past experiences have been, no matter the failures of the past, Christ is able to bring complete salvation, to restore not just the, um, the spiritual man, but the physical man as well. He's able to completely restore and to transform lives. And we know that many here are testaments, living, breathing testimonies to God's power to transform the heart, transform the mind, uh, to transform the life from a life of degradation and sin to a life that can be ennobled and elevated by his grace. All right, amen. All right, and what do I want to add to that? What do I want to add to that that you just commented here? If not, question 14. Question 14. Of what did he speak by his spirit to the prophets before he became man? We're going to go to 1 Peter chapter 1 from verse 9 through to 11. The question is, of what did he speak by his spirit to the prophets before he became man. So 1 Peter 1, chapter, um, 1 Peter 1 from verse 9 through to 11 says this, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ which was in them did signify, which had testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. This is interesting. You know, when Sister White quotes this scripture, um, she quoted it in, uh, in the great controversy where the individuals there, it's time period of the Millerite movement were saying that the prophecies could not be understood and she quoted this and said look at the zeal i'm just paraphrasing look at the zeal of these holy men of god as they searched out these scriptures with all the power of, of their mind that they had and they were earnestly seeking to improve upon the light that they had and to gain more light versus a listless concern of god's professed people in which the things that they wrote were specifically for them because it was written up for them upon whom the ends of the world has come and all things were written for our admonition and for our learning. And so she quoted this in a very powerful fashion to say, look at the zeal of these guys in searching out these things and we in which these things are written for just are sit back, laid back and spend no time, a lot of the times and efforts, or even if we do, there's not diligent time and diligent effort in searching out these things as did these prophets. But the prophets then really suffer, um, testified of the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, the salvation that should follow, the sufferings of Christ, and the fact that he will see the travail of his soul and be satisfied, his sufferings would not be for nothing because it would result in the salvation of millions and the lifting up of many that would have been degraded in sin to occupy a place in heaven, even for many to sit down on his throne as he overcame and sit down on his father's throne as well. All right. So we're seeing the things which the prophets prophesied of um, about Christ. It's about his sufferings and the glory that should follow. Anybody want to make a comment on that? I believe that's uh, a very powerful point there in 1 Peter chapter 1, 9 to 11. Anybody want to comment on that? Just a brief point, Brother Matthew. Um, 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13 augments what you just bring out. Uh, it says, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, suffering, that is to try you as though some strange thing happened. But verse 13 says, in as much as we suffer with him, we shall be partakers of his glory when it shall be revealed. And Ellen White tells us that one of the greatest privileges that, afford, that is afforded to us is to enter into his suffering. Amen, amen. 
And so indeed, when you talk about the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, it's not only Christ alone that is to suffer and then to be glorified after as well. His saints should also, well, will suffer also and has suffered also in many time periods of persecutions and uh, um, lots of loss uh, sustained. But the glory that follow is a more eternal weight of glory. So because of the more eternal rate of glory, the sufferings really should sink into insignificance. Um, and that's how the prophets and the holy men of God of old look upon these things. These call them the light um, burden or light persecution, because when you look at the overwhelming weight of the glory of what awaits the saints in glory, it is truly, um, really and truly, these things of this world and the perplexities of this world really should sink into insignificance. Sadly, that's not always the case, but it really should be the case, and we should strive to make that the case, even among us as his people. All right? Question 15. Question 15. What was the Savior's purpose in coming into the world? That's the question. What was the Savior's purpose in coming into the world? First scripture given, 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 15. 1 Timothy chapter 5, chapter 1, I should say, and verse 15. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15. And it says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. So Christ came into the world to save sinners. Matthew chapter one and verse 21. Matthew chapter one and verse 21. And it says, and she shall bring forth a son and thou shalt call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins. And so we will see, or we see that Christ saves his people from their sins, not in their sins, but from their sins. He allows us to be recreated in his image, to have Christ in us, the hope of glory. So we can reach the standard which the father said, which is to say, be holy as if how oh, your father in heaven is holy even though that may not be the experience of many in Adventism today, but really and truly that is a standard that is set before us, a high standard indeed, but with Christ, all things are possible and by God's grace, we can reach that standard. Another well-known scripture that um, I believe fits perfectly into what was the Savior's purpose as the coming into the world is John 3, verse 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but God but shall have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He sent not his son to condemn the world, but that we may be saved. And I can say amen, and we can say amen for that. Now, question 16. If there's no comment upon another reason why Christ would have entered the world, question 16. The question 16 says, for what does he come the second time? For what does he come the second time? Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 28. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 28. And when we're there, um, we will read, and I'll read in your hearing. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So we're seeing here that he's coming, and he's coming for those who are looking for him, those who are watching and praying. Um, for these individuals, the ones that know the time and know what to do, these individuals, he comes the second time without sin unto salvation because these individuals will have their sins blotted out, removed from the record of the heavenly sanctuary and that these sins will no longer be held against them. He's coming without sin unto salvation. The sin of the righteous, the sins of the righteous, those who have been repentant and been converted, these, their sins have been blotted out and for the ones that are living on the earth at that time they would have received refreshing the seal of the living god the latter rain and these would be looking for him and they'll be saying something very specific when he comes and we're going to look at that 
um, in the next question, question 17. Notice it says, what will be said in that day by those who are waiting on him or those that are looking for him, those who are looking for the return of the savior? What will be said by those? Um, there's something very specific they will say. So Isaiah chapter 29 and 25 and verse nine. So let's look at what they're saying. Isaiah chapter 25 and verse nine. What are they saying? And it shall be said in that day, lo, this is our God. We have waited for him. And he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Amen. I can just imagine, can use um, a sanctified imagination and just imagine um, what the saints, the living saints at that point would have gone through, uh, going through the great time of trouble, seeing the earth desolated by the plague, seeing the persecution, seeing the death of their loved ones and friends. Finally, um, fully frustrated and just tired of this world of sin and death and to realize the, the sure results. They would have seen the results of iniquity with the uh, massive amounts of death and the destruction and the ruin and degradation of this world. And they'll be so tired of it. And finally, finally, Christ come. Just imagine the relief. Just can imagine the, the emotion and the joy and the the things that would have um, draw these words from these lips say, lo, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. This is our Lord. We have waited for him. We'll be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Indeed, it is a sublime, sublime thought. And there is on the other spectrum, a uh, sad thought uh, because question 18, the last question, what will the wicked do and say? And for the answer, we'll go to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. We're going to read from verse 14 through to verse 17. So Revelation chapter 6 from verse 14 through to verse 17. And it says, And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the den and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? You know, the saddest part about this is that voice of Christ, they would have heard many times coming to them. They would recognize him. They would know that this was the individual speaking to me, telling me to turn for all these years and uh, giving me so many chances on top of chances upon, on top of chances. And uh, they would have turned away their ears from him. And that very same recognizable voice, because it has been speaking to them for, for years in, the, in their existence, that very same voice, He's going to say, depart from me, I know you're not. That very same voice is going to say what we saw in Proverbs chapter 1, where you would none of my reproofs. You, wouldn't, you would despise my counsel. Therefore, I'm going to laugh when your calamity comes, when it cometh. And so, indeed, uh, it is, uh, again, a sad situation and something we should pray that we are not a part of this class of people. Because there are only two classes, as we know, seed of the serpent, the seed of the woman. And the work of the everlasting gospel is by the introduction of the prophetic message to separate the classes and to separate the two, um, the seed, the seed of the woman from the seed of the serpent. We're seeing being manifest here at the end, at the coming of Christ, but the seed of the woman will be looking up and because their redemption draweth now, they will see Christ and they will be so grateful and so happy to finally see him and to be delivered. But the seed of the serpent that be running away from him, hiding in the dens and the caves of the earth. The final scripture, Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2 from verse 18 through to 21. Isaiah chapter 2 from verse 18 through to 21. What will the wicked say? And the idols he shall utterly abolish. And they shall go into the holes of the rocks and in the caves of the earth. For fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty, when he ariseth to shake terrible the earth, 
In that day, a man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they have each day, sorry, which they made each one for himself to worship to the moles and to the bats, to go into the cliffs of the rocks and into the tops of the jagged rocks for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he ariseth to shake terrible the earth. And we see what makes the wicked, they designate them as the wicked at this point in time. They have idols. And that's just the case. They have something in their life that they are putting in front of God. Now, if you do a Bible study upon idols, we can understand that idols is something literally that someone worship would have Baal, you have Asterisk, you have all the different um, false gods of different deities that the ancient um, pagans did worship. We know that paganism was intertwined with Christianity and it made its way and that the result of this great compromise was the man of sin. But idolatry is not so bla is not just this blatant outward idolatry. Anything that we place above God and put um, anything that prevents God from doing his full work in our life, let me say that, is an idol. What are our idols today? What do we put in front of God that does that prevents God from working out his will fully in our lives? Because these things um, can separate us totally from God. If we do not overcome them, they will be the means of separating us finally and forever from the Lord. The idol can be, or the Bible lets us know that they're teachers of lies. It can be false doctrines. It can be doctrines that we entertain that's not biblical. And these things can result in the loss of souls because there, there's no false doctrine that is entertained. There's no doctrinal wine of Babylon that's entertained without it causing hurt and destruction of the individual that entertains it. It could be um, the different things in our lives. It could be our children, if we could before God. It could be things that God intended to be a blessing in our lives. It could be our wives, it could be um, friends, it could be family, it could be our job, it could be a title, it could be a position. Anything that separates us from God is an idol. And this is what um, will separate the righteous and the wicked. Do we cast off our idols and give all to Christ? Or do we allow that idol to come before between us and Christ? And I believe that's the end of it. And I also believe that's the end of my time as well. Anybody want to make any comments um, before we close off? Okay, Brother Matthew, just want to say thank you so much for really um, giving a masterful presentation on the lesson you have given scope to the skeletal outline we have there, and we really appreciate it. We appreciate your allowing God to use you and the spirit to teach us through this presentation today. God bless you, and thank you so much. You have manipulated the time very well as well. So at this time, we're going to turn over to um, our hosts that are in charge of today's program.